be in the house of the Lord and feel His presence yes. and to come to worship. I'm glad we can worship God yes. in spirit and in truth and praise the Lord for the privilege of being back here in Concord and enjoy it. I feel like uh, we're going to have revival. Yes. Don't you feel like that? Amen. I believe that. The Bible says if we'll do four things, God said I'll do three things. Yes. He said if my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves, that's the first thing. And then he said pray. And then he said, seek my face. And then he said, turn from your wicked ways. I'll do three things. I'll hear from heaven. I'll forgive your sin. And I'll heal the land. And it's good to be able to hear from heaven and come into the house of the Lord and enjoy what God has for us. I like to hear from heaven when I come to church. I like to hear from heaven in a revival meeting. Brother, if we don't hear from heaven, we won't have a revival meeting. But I like to come and enjoy it, and I appreciate being here with Brother Sammy and you this week. I feel like I did the first time, I think I told them this over in South Carolina last week, first time I ever met two big fellas. I mean, they're two great, big, robust fellas. I was in a place called Danridge, Tennessee. We was having a meeting up there in Danridge, and uh, boy, it got the devil stirred up. And one night while I was preaching, they drove a truck up and stole the coal out of the church while I was preaching. Now, I told him, I said, you may cut off the power down there, but you can't cut it off from coming up here. Amen. But while I was preaching up there, never will forget, we had a fellowship on a Friday. And in that fellowship, we'd gone up on the hill, a bunch of us preachers to pray. And as we got ready to come down for the afternoon service, I looked in a big old car stop, and a great big fella got out. And he hollered a couple of times, and I said to uh, the pastor, I said, who is that big old guy down there? He said, that's Billy Kelly. Said he hadn't been saved too long. Said he sings and shouts around. I said, well, that's good. Wasn't long till another big old car, old fashioned car pulled up and a bigger fella got out. And I thought, Lord have mercy, I hope nobody else comes up around here. But uh, when the car stopped, a great big fella got out. And I said, well, who's that fella? And he said, that's Bobby Grubbs. And so we went into church after a while. We got down there and I'd met him. And they called on uh, Brother Billy to sing. And he got over there and got to singing, I'll not be a stranger. And boy, I mean, it got good. And he got to crying and heaven got to witnessing around there. And when he got through singing, Brother Herman Helson jumped up and he said, I want Brother Bobby Grubbs to pray. He's just been saved, hadn't been saved too long, and I want him to pray. And I never will forget what Bobby prayed. In fact, I'll try to imitate him just a little here. He was praying and he prayed something like this, the Lord, and it is sure is good. And I mean, he said, Lord, did you hear me? And this is good. And he said, Lord, this is good. This is so good. Let me pack a little lunch and take some home. Hallelujah. Amen. And I believe that's the way it ought to be in revival meeting, brother. You ought to pack a little lunch, take some home when you come to the house of the Lord. And when you come to worship, you come to worship. And when you go out, you go out to serve. And I hope that you'll come every night to worship and let's have a great time. I want you to take your Bible tonight and turn to Acts chapter 17. And I'm going to read from Acts chapter 17. It's a great chapter. In fact, I like the book of Acts. Let me give you something that'll help you when you're studying the Bible. Never get your doctrine for the church out of the book of Acts. Get your doctrine out of the epistles. And you won't get all mixed up. If you'll get your doctrine, remember that. Don't ever turn to the book of Acts. Uh, the book of Acts is just the history of the church, the early church, and what it did. And uh, if you'll remember that, it'll help you. So don't get your doctrine out of the book of Acts. A lot of people do get a lot of doctrine. That's where they get mixed up and get all, you know, sidetracked and get off on something that's not right. But in Acts chapter 17, I'm going to have you to stand in a moment for the reading of the Scriptures. Ever since January the 1st, I've had people to stand when I read the Scriptures. I believe we ought to reverence this book. I don't believe there's a greater book. I don't believe there's a book to compare with it. I don't believe there's a book like it, because this is God's book. Amen. And we ought to reverence the book of God. I preached one time years ago on some things that ought not to be in the Bible. And people came and they said, boy, he's messed up now. But I got to preaching. I said, the first thing ought to be in the Bible, you ought to have any four-leaf clovers in there. Say amen right there. Amen. I said, those little locks of curl hair, you know, you ram it there in the Bible, it ought to be in your Bible. Bible's no place to put little locks of hair. And I said, get some of those insurance policies and all that stuff you got crammed back there. And some of you, you know that nobody's going to bother the Bible. 
So if you get an extra dollar, you'll stick it in there because you know nobody's going to get that. Amen? I mean, if you put it in the Bible, ain't nobody going to bother the Bible. And it's a good safe key. I mean, it's a good safe place to keep it. But uh, the Word of God, we ought to reverence the Bible. And I want you to stand after you turn. Acts chapter 17. Let's everybody stand together. I'm going to begin reading. Read a few verses of Scripture. And then I'm going to have you to be seated. I'm going to pray. And then bring you the message tonight. Acts chapter 17. I'm going to begin reading with verse 4. 4 of chapter 17. The Bible said to some, And some of them believed and consorted with Paul and Silas and of devout Greeks a great multitude and of the chief women not a few. But the Jews, which believed not, moved with envy, and took unto them certain lewd fellows of the baser sort, and gathered a company, and set all the city in an uproar. Let me stop there, because there's a comma. A lot of people, all they'll ever do is start an uproar around. Amen? I mean the wrong kind of uproar. They'll start the wrong kind. And he said, uh, as he wrote here, he said, and assaulted the house of Jason, and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, by the way, let me stop here. You know who they're looking for? They were looking for four men. They were looking for Paul and Silas and Timothy and Luke. And they were looking for these four men and couldn't find them. Especially Paul. They wanted to find Paul. And they didn't find them. So they went over there to Paul's friend. Now, you better be careful who you're a friend to. Because when they come after them, they may get you. Now, that's what the book says right here. They came over there and assaulted this man Jason's house and sought to bring them out to the people. And when they found them not, they drew Jason and certain brethren unto the rulers of the city, crying, These men that have turned the world upside down are come hither also. Now notice what the Bible says. These have come out hither also, whom Jason hath received, and these all do contrary to the decrees of Caesar, saying that there is another king, one Jesus. They'll find out one day that there's not but one, glory to God, and his name is the Lord Jesus Christ. Now let's read on. And they troubled the people and the rulers of the city when they heard these things. And when they'd taken uh, of Jason and of the other, they let them go. Now I want you to look back with me, and I'm going to let you be seated. It says in verse 6, it says the latter part, These that have turned the world upside down, and here's what uh, most people don't see when they read this. And that the ark come hither also. Now they didn't mind from turning the world upside down over there where they were, and I'll tell you in a minute. But the thing that bothered them was that they'd come over there and they're afraid they're going to turn their world upside down. You see, they don't mind for you doing something down the road, but when you come dig up their potato patch, brother, it gets kind of, uh, you know, it gets sticky around there. And so it says, and they came also, are come hither also. Now let me look this way, and then I'm going to have you to be seated, and I'm going to have you to bow your head for a word of prayer. You know who said this about these men? I mean, many times when we read the Bible, we don't know really who said the, what's going on. See, the Bible writes it as it is, just puts it down, and, and uh, the Scripture said, these men have turned the world upside down. Do you know who said that? Lewd men. Base, baser men, sort of men. I mean, wicked men. Boy, when the church gets so that the devil's crowd out there will say, I want to tell you that bunch up there is turning the world upside down. We'll get now. It wasn't religious people that said that. They brought them in front of the city council and said, We got an accusation. These men have turned the world upside down. And these wicked men were the ones that had to confess that. Boy, I read that the other day, and that like to bless me to death. I said, the devil's crowd, and everybody else will know when the church is on fire, and when the church does something, brother, I tell you, the devil's crowd will know about it. And these men have turned the world upside down. Now, one other thing, and then I'm going to have you to be seated. And they didn't stop there, and they said, they've come hither also. Boy, I tell you, if we kept over there, we'd be in good shape. But we got them on our hands, and what are we going to do with them? Would you be seated all over the house? All over the house, would you bow your heads all over the house? Every head bowed, every eye closed. And it says, and these men have turned the world upside down. I like that. Oh, these men have done something great. These men have turned the world 
upside down. Our Father, we thank you tonight for every blessing of the Word of God. I'm glad that the Bible is still forever and eternally always will be for settled in heaven. And I thank you tonight, our Father, that we can read it and we can believe it and we can live it, that we can build our hopes upon the precious Word of God. And I pray, Lord, as we preach the Word tonight, that men and women, boys and girls here at Concord may get such a vision that, oh, they may be so stirred until they get out of their complacency and out of the apathy and indifference that they're in. And oh God, may we realize that the church can march on even today, that God's people can do something now. And I pray, our Father, that you'll stir every person. Oh God, may this be an unusual night. And I pray for that man that's backslidden, cold, indifferent on the Lord. Lord, I pray for that precious lady that came tonight. And she's not where she ought to be with God. I pray, our Father, for the church. Will thou not revive us again in the midst of the years? In wrath, remember mercy, that thy people may rejoice again in thee. I pray for Brother Sammy and the great load that he carries. I'm glad God he's a busy man going up and down this country, weeping over the lost and preaching the word of God. Then I thank you for these other preachers. God bless them and challenge them tonight. And then, Lord, for every hungry heart, I pray that we'll feast at the table of God. And, Lord, all you do for us, everything that you do for us, we'll praise you because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Beloved, tonight I want to speak to you on these men have turned the world upside down. I don't know whether that ever struck you right or not. I'm glad the other day when I was reading it, it just jumped out and got a hold of me. And I read it again. And I read it the third time. It said, these men, who was he talking about? He's talking about the people in Thessalonica. But I want to go back in order to understand this. You've got to know the where, you've got to know the how, you've got to know the therefore of why it was spoken. Let's go back to the 16th chapter and we find Paul praying. Boy, as he's praying, the Bible said God gave him a vision. And in that vision, he saw a man. I'm glad we can see that same man. And brother, every person needs to see that man. If you've never seen Jesus, you missed it all. I'm glad my eyes of faith. I've seen the Lord. And when a man sees God, my friend, it makes a difference in his life. Isaiah said, woe is me. My eyes have seen the king. And when we see the Lord, it makes a difference. And then Paul heard him speak. And I believe that every man ought to hear him speak. This man was Jesus. And he said, as he talked to through this man, the Bible talks about this lost man. And he said, come over to Macedonia and help us. Uh, they needed help over there. And so this lost man uh, said, I want you to come, Paul, and help us. Uh, and as he caught, talked to him, uh, and as he cried out, come over for help, uh, old Paul got Silas. Uh, and then in a few days, they went over to a place called Thessalonica. Uh, now, Thessalonica, they didn't stay there but 30 days. Uh, Paul stayed in Corinth a year and a half. Uh, I mean, he, did, he didn't have to run. Uh, but it was so hot. Uh, and I mean, the uh, hatred was so against Paul uh, until he had to get out uh, in 30 days. Uh, but I'll tell you, Paul could do more in 30 days, uh, and Silas could do more in 30 days uh, over there, brother, than most people could do in a lifetime. Uh, and the Bible says uh, that they came, uh, but before they came, uh, they did something at Philippi. Uh, they went over into the land uh, of Macedonia. The Bible said the chief city was called Philippi. Uh, and three things uh, turned that thing upside down. Uh, the first thing that on the Sabbath, uh, there's having a prayer meeting down by the river. Uh, you talk about a time, children, uh, there's uh, getting a hold of God. Uh, and old Paul and Silas went down by that river. Uh, after a while, maybe Paul or Silas uh, got up and started preaching. Uh, and the Bible said, God opened a woman's heart. Uh, you know who that woman was? Uh, the Bible said she was a sales lady. Uh, she was a seller of purple. Uh, and God opened her heart. Uh, men cannot be saved uh, until God opens their hearts. And I'm so glad, praise the Lord, that God 
can open your heart. And when God opened her heart, she believed. And she became a great friend of the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad for those that I've seen, Brother Sammy, up and down this country, whose hearts God has opened. And praise God, they're friends. We've still got some friends to the old-fashioned gospel. We've still got some friends to the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm glad everybody's not serving the devil and everybody's not sold out to modernism. And so the Bible said she believed when God opened her heart. And then Paul and Silas go uptown. And that's usually when you when you get in trouble. It was a wicked city. I imagine as wicked as Atlanta. Or maybe even worse. And old Paul and Silas is walking down the street. And a little fortune telling girl. I started following up the street. Now let me say fortune tellings of the devil. All you need to know about your fortune. It's found in this book. It tells you where you used to be. It tells you where you are now. And bless God it tells you all about the future. The book of God is that you need to know. And so the Bible said this, this little girl came running along behind these two preachers. And you know what that little girl confessed? She said these men are servants of the most high God. Boy listen, let me say this to you tonight. If you live right and if you walk right even the devil's crowd's going to say that you're a man of God. You're a woman of God. And the Bible said this little girl kept following old Paul in silence. And then all at once Paul turned around and cast the demons of the devil out of that little girl. And you know what she did? She got out of the fortune telling business. Praise God when a person gets saved he'll get in another kind of business. I don't believe a man saved if he's still in the same business that he's always been in. When a man gets saved brother he'll walk right he'll talk right he'll live right. I mean when they're really saved. And so this little girl got out of the business. And it stirred that town. They took old Paul and Silas, beat their backs, and threw them into prison. But about midnight, when old Paul said, I'll tell you, we need to contact heaven, they started singing in the prison. The Bible said the prisoners heard them. And while they were singing, and while they were praying, Brother God sent an angel down there. I want to tell you, that angel got a hold of that jailhouse. And the Bible said there was a great earthquake. And Brother the doors flew open and the stocks fell off and God shook that place and turned it upside down for God. But that's not all. The Bible said a flipping jailer, an old hard-hearted jailer, took out his sword and he saw the doors open and he said, my life, they'll probably have put me in jail. My life will be in jeopardy if they escape. And he started to fall on his sword and old Paul said, hey, do thyself no harm. We're all all here, praise God. Did you know God's people are not cowards? They don't have to run, praise the Lord. You say, well, what happened? The Bible said he took a, a I'd seen come of the candle light it and fall down before Paul and Silas. And as he falls down before Paul and Silas, he said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And you say, brother Mays, what did Paul tell him? He said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And thine house, praise the Lord. I'm glad I believe in household salvation. I not only believe that God will save you, I believe you'll save your whole house. And can't you imagine the news traveling the next day. Everybody talking about a little fortune telling girl being saved. Everybody talking about a saleswoman being saved. Everybody talking about a, a man that was a hard-hearted jailer. And they said, you know, these men are doing something for God. But Paul actually heard and saw that vision went over to the land of Thessalonica. And when they, he got there, they said, he's had and they go down some wicked, unbelieving Jews. And the Bible said they assaulted Jason's house. They knocked out the windows. 
They tore down the doors. They dragged those Christians out and said, where's Paul and Silas? And they, they didn't find them. You see, God had hit them. And when God had you, bless God, the devil can't find you. Say amen right there. I'm glad the Lord had hit them. And the Word of God said that these base men, these lewd fellows, took Jason and his friends before the city council. And the city council sat there and stroked their beards and said, what is the accusation against these men? And you know what they said? These old wicked God-denying men said these men have turned the world upside down and have come hither also. And so what a blessing to have wicked men to confess that these men have turned the world upside down. Now, if you've got your pencils tonight, I want to give you six reasons why I believe that these men were such a caliber until they could turn the world upside down. You say, Brother Mays, why did the wicked know that these men had turned the world upside down? Number one, these men had a foundation that had never been shaken. Bless God, when you get established right, uh, and when you get on the rock, Christ Jesus, uh, and when you really stand on the foundation, uh, I want to tell you, you can do something for God. Uh, I've never known a church, uh, I've never known a preacher uh, that ever did anything for God uh, until they uh, got rooted and grounded on the foundation uh, that God says there is no other foundation to be laid uh, than that which is laid. Uh, oh, Isaiah said, I lay in Zion a foundation foundation, a stone, a tried stone, a precious cornerstone, a sure foundation. And I want you to know these men had a foundation that was never going to be shaken. Brother, when everything else is gone, if you're standing on the foundation, thank God he'll stand. And I'm glad these men had a foundation that could never be shaken. What a blessing it is to find men today that are rooted in battle and standing on the foundation. The Bible said it's like unto two men. In the book of Matthew chapter 7, one man built his house on the sand. And the sand, it'll take and go down. I'm glad the wise man built his house on the rock. And when the wind blew and the storm came, the Bible said that house stood. You say, preacher, what made the difference? One man built on the rock. I'm glad, praise God, in some Psalm 40, he lifted me out uh, and put me on the solid rock. Uh, and I'm like the little girl when she was testifying. She got nervous and she said to the people, she said, my knees may knock, uh, but the rock standing steadfast, I'm standing on. Uh, thank God the foundation, uh, Isaiah said, is sure. Uh, and praise God, you don't have to worry uh, if the foundation uh, is the unshakable foundation. Uh, God was talking through Paul. Uh, Paul said to the church at Corinth, uh, he talked about the material uh, that we're going to have when we stand before him. Uh, and then in verse 11, he said, no uh, other foundation, uh, brother there is no other foundation if you're building on church entity and if you're building on baptism and if you're building tonight brother on doing the best you can I want you to know that foundation will go down but if you're standing on the rock of ages you can sing rock of ages cleft for me let me hide myself in thee years ago in Shelby North Carolina a precious old lady was dying and as she was dying oh, the preacher came and the little nurse said, I said, I want to tell you something. Said, he, said ain't you slipping? The preacher said, what did you say? And the little nurse said, I tell you, I tell you, that, that, that little lady's granny, uh, ain't you slipping? The preacher said, I don't believe it. And he walked over and looked at her, and her eyes was already set in her head. That little saint of God lying there in the bed. And preacher Campbell leaned over and said, ain't it? Is it true that you're slipping? And she didn't say anything. He said, ain't it? Is it true that you're slipping? And then her eyes opened up and she started clapping those little hands. She said, shame on you, preacher. How are you going to slip when you're marred up in the rock of ages? I want you to know tonight that there is a foundation that's both sure and steadfast. And what a great testimony. You say, Brother Mace, why did these men turn the world upside down? First of all, they had a foundation that had never been 
been shaken. Secondly, they had a first love that they'd never left. Now, the saddest thing I've ever seen is a Christian who's left his first love. But the most exciting thing in this world, find a young Christian, bless God, that's never gotten over it, a church that's happy in Jesus. Praise the Lord with the first love. It's blessed. And I thank God for that first love. I find some that shout today, and the next time you see them, they've lost their shout. I find some, brother, that praise God today, and the next time you see them, they say, well, I don't feel like praising God. I'm glad I got in this crowd when I first got saved. I had a first love and a thrill, and I've never got no it. Praise the Lord. It's a love that's thrilling. It's a love that's exciting. It's first love. Paul writing to the church at Ephesus, Revelation chapter 2 said, I know your works, and he comes on down, and he says, I know about your labor. I know about how you couldn't stand those that claim to be apostles, and you proved them to be liars. He said, I know your, I know your faithfulness. But then he comes on down, and he says, but I, nevertheless, I have somewhat against you, for you've left your first love. I mean, he said, you don't love it like you used to. You don't pray like you used to. It's not as thrilling. That first love has vanished. And it's sad that we got people uh, all tonight uh, that have left their first love. Uh, but what a thrill it is to see a young person get saved. Uh, then he can't wait to get to church. Uh, I mean, he's here before the doors ever open. Uh, brother, he's standing outside uh, waiting for that door to open. Uh, he can't wait for the singing to start. Uh, he can't wait for the preaching. Uh, I used to have a fellow in my church named Red Williams. Uh, and he sat on the front right where this brother sitting. And oh, he's the only fellow I ever saw that had eat the gospel. I mean, the Bible said, be ye all uh, uh, doers of the word, uh, but he'd eat it while I was preaching. He'd sit right there on the front, uh, and he'd reach out every once in a while and say, give me another bite. Hallelujah. And he'd sit there and just eat it, uh, and after a while, he'd get good, uh, and old Red would slip out on the edge of that pew, uh, and he'd reach out and say, thank you, give me another bite. Hallelujah. Uh, you say, preacher, he was excited about it. Uh, I mean, he couldn't wait to get to the word uh, and to the table of God. Uh, there are too many of us tonight, uh, and that first love and that first thrill, uh, it's not like it used to be. Uh, and these men that turned the world upside down, uh, they had a foundation uh, that had never been shaken. Uh, they had a first love that they'd never left. Uh, I mean, it was still uh, just as fresh to them uh, because the Bible said they continued uh, daily. Uh, I mean, they, they never got used to it. Uh, they continued daily uh, in prayer uh, and in the Word uh, and in bread in a bread, uh, then in fellowship. Uh, brother, it was still fresh to them. Uh, and there's nothing like having that first love uh, and being thrilled about it. Uh, you give me ten men uh, in this church, brother, uh, that's thrilled and excited. Uh, you give me ten women in this church uh, that still got that first love. Uh, I'll tell you, we'll have a revival uh, that'll stir this country. Uh, and the wicked men will say, uh, oh, they're turning the world upside down uh, over there in Concord Baptist Church. Uh, my wife's here tonight, and she knows that when we first got married, she'd drop a handkerchief. You know, you ever drop a handkerchief? Yeah, and you know, you, you, and she said, Maze, you'd uh, turn two tumble salts. Now pick it up. And said, now, said, I can drop it. And said, bless God, you just walk on. I have to reach over and get it myself. I, she said, there was a time, Maze, when we'd get, you start getting the car, you'd open the door, and you'd help me get in. And said, now, I have to ask you to stop when we get halfway down the block so I can get my leg in. I caught my leg still out the door. And you say, Brother Maze, what is that? Now, Doc, we're talking to Jimmy. You know it's so. But a lot of people, did you know something? They used to have that first look. Kind of like the old colored preacher down here named Mose. Uh, and he got married. And after he'd been married six months, he sat across the table and his wife said to him, Mose, you said before we got married, you loved me so good you could eat me. He said, what's wrong? Uh, he kind of scratched his head and said, I lost my appetite somewhere along the way. Uh, and did you know there's a lot of people, brother, uh, they used to have an appetite for the Word. Uh, they used to have an appetite for the church. Uh, they had a first love. And listen, uh, nothing will take the place uh, of the thrill of that first love. And the saddest thing in the world is to find a preacher. And he says, well, I used to enjoy it. And I used to shout. And I used to study the Word. And I used to preach the Word. But I got over my first love. 
have turned the world upside down. Not only did they have a love, my friend, that had had in the beginning a first love that had never left, but in the third place, they had a faith that couldn't be shipwrecked. I like that, brother. They believed something. They had anchored their faith in the Word of God. Somebody asked me the other night in North Carolina, said, Brother Mays, what's your creed? What do you believe? I just handed him the Bible. I said, right there it is. Sixty-six books, glory to God. I said, there it is. Thirty-nine in the old, twenty-seven in the new. I said, there's what I believe, the Word of God. And brother, when we have a faith that's in the Word of God, nothing will shake it. But the Bible says in Second Timothy that some have had their faith shipwrecked. And he said some had been overthrown in their faith. And brother, that's true. We got those today that are faith wreckers. We got preachers, if you go to hear them, they'll wreck your faith and tell you that you can't believe in the supernatural and the power of God anymore. They'll tell you the blood has lost its effectiveness. They'll tell you that there's no such thing as the new birth and old time religion. I got news for that crowd. They waited too late to tell me that. Oh, praise God, I know there's something to it. And the blood has never lost its power. I'm glad tonight I'd stand here and say that my faith is anchored in God. They, I, I never will forget one night I was preaching in Greenville, South Carolina. And a man came down the aisle and his pocket was taken out. I didn't know what he had in his pocket. And a man whispered me, he's got a snake in his pocket. And if I'd have known that, I'd have been three blocks down the road because I'm afraid of snakes. I'm afraid of big ones, little ones, dead ones, and live ones. I'm, t- I'm afraid of snakes. And that man stood there and I said to the man that told me that, I said, what's he got that snake in his pocket for? He said he believes he can demonstrate his faith. I said he's wrong. God didn't say that faith cometh by handling snakes. It said faith coming by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You say, Brother Mays, I want faith. Stick your nose in this book and praise God you'll find faith. And if you want something to thrill you, turn to the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews and begin to read about all of those that had faith and see how they overcame. Read about that catalog of great and marvelous Christians. Bless God that had all these victories. It says, and by faith, and it says, and by faith, and it says, and by faith. Brother, it's by faith. God honors faith. God is pleased to work through faith. And I'm glad, praise the Lord. I believed it when I first got saved. And I've been saved nearly 37 years. And bless God, I still believe it. My faith, it's just like it was except stronger because I've learned to study the Word of God. And somebody said, preacher, why could these men turn the world upside down? They had a faith that had never been shipwrecked. Number four, they had a fire that had never been quenched. I mean, they wasn't cold. Listen, don't you hate to go to church and it's colder than oh, on an iceberg? I want to tell you, I hate to go to church and hear a bunch sing and they sing and you freeze to death. I hate to get up and hear a preacher preach and he doesn't warn me. I like to feel something, brother, when he's preaching the Word of God. I believe that we can. There's a warmth about the Holy Ghost and about the preaching of the Word. You remember what John the Baptist said when he came out? Wiping honey out of his mouth and sugar cane out of his hair. Matthew 3, you know what he said? One mightier than I shall come. He'll baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with F-I-R-E fire. I believe this with all of my soul tonight. The church needs to get on fire. And the church ought not to quench the fires of God. Brother, there's one thing that will settle your problems. And the Bible says in 1 Kings chapter 18, about verse 38, Then... T-H-E-N. It, then the fire fell. Something had to precede that then. But then the fire of the Lord fell. And when the fire of God falls, I want to tell you something. It'll take care of your problems. When the fire of God 
God is in our midst, brother. The devil can't do anything with a preacher that's on fire. He can't do anything with a Christian that's on fire. He can't stop a church, bless God, that's on fire. No, sir, the devil can't stop that kind of church. But these men had a fire in their souls that had never been quenched. Let me show you something. You know what that word really means? And I don't go into all this Greek business. And I took some, but I, I don't go into that. But you know what the word, word quench is in Greek? It means smother. Smother! And a lot of people, brother, they take them some old cold dead religion and smothered all the fire they ever had out. I, I want to fan it, bless God, and still. You know, I, okay, I want to fan the fire. I, I want to get the blaze of burning just a little brighter. I never will forget when I was a little boy. My daddy took me to hear a Nazarene preacher. And that Nazarene preacher st 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 stuttered. And he's a, a big old fella. I sat in the back. My daddy said, now, son, you just listen. He's going to tell you something good. And he'd been in a wreck, and he got up. I never will forget him. And uh, uh, he, he got up, and he stood up, and he said, he said, Tom, my aunt, me, what I'm going to preach on now. He said, I'm going to preach on Jesus. I wouldn't even say him. Goosebumps ran down my arm when he said, I'm going to preach on Jesus. And, brother, he hadn't been preaching for a little while. He told this when I was a kid, sitting in the back of the church. Never have forgotten it. He said, I'm from Oklahoma. And he said, when me and my brother lived in Oklahoma, we had a hard time. We had to work. Get up early in the morning. Plow an old mule all day long. And said, one day we got a hold of a mule that wouldn't plow. He said, I mean, that mule was stubborn. As stubborn as some of you church members. And boy, I mean, you thought that's stubborn. Did you know that? And he said, that mule was stubborn. And he said, I got mad as a little boy. And I got that mule by the ear and I bit his ear and he till wouldn't plow. And said, my brother said, buddy. And his name was Uncle Buddy Robinson. And he said, uh, and my brother said, Buddy, said, you go in the house and get some newspapers. And said, we'll make that move plow. And he said, I went in the house, got some newspapers. We came back on there and piled all them newspapers under that move tummy. And said, we struck a match. And when that fire hit that move, I said, he ain't stopped plowing since. <laughs> and did you know I know some churches I'd like to build the fire of God under. I know some preachers, brother, that need the fire of God to be built on them. And these men turned the world upside down. Because the fire had not been quiet quenched in their souls. But I meet so many that are cold and the fire's been quenched and the fire's gone out. And brother, that's the saddest thing in the world. Oh, if we can kindle a little fire and the fires of heaven will burn. Number five, quickly tonight, they had a friend. Oh, listen to me, that they wasn't ashamed of. I mean, they wasn't ashamed to tell about Jesus wherever they went. They said, I want to tell you about what he did for me. Why, you take Paul, if you want something to thrill you, read the, all of the book of Acts. And when you get through, you'll find three times in the book of Acts, Paul said, did I ever tell you how it happened? A light shined out of eternity. A voice from heaven spoke to me, and I was smitten to the ground. And Paul testified of what God had done, and what Jesus meant to him. Now I tell you, brother, when we are ashamed of the Lord, we'll never turn anything upside down for God. Listen to what Jesus said. He said, if you're ashamed of me in this sinful and adulterous generation, I will also be ashamed of you. And I want to tell you something. It's sad to find people that are ashamed of the one that died. Ashamed of the one my friend that was raised from the dead. And ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. I tell you, my mother's been dead about nine years. But if the door opened back yonder and She'd start stand there. I'd say to this brother, "Would you go back under, and would you leave my mother down and let me hear, let her hear a boy preach tonight?" And then, if that door opened, uh, my dad's been dead about nine years. Mother about four or five. And if my mother would stand there, and I'd have her led down here, and I'd say, "I want you to hear me preach tonight." And then I'd look back and say, Homer, go back and get my dad and lead him down here. I want him to hear me preach. But if that door would open back on her tonight, and Jesus would step in that door, hold up that nail, pierced hand, I'd say, Brother, keep your seat. I'd say, Homer, keep your seat. I'd run back there and rip put my arm around him. And I'd hold up that hand, walk down the aisle, and say, Here he is, friends. He came all the way from heaven, died on a cross for me. I'd hold up that nail, pierced hand. I'd say Jesus is mine and I'm his.
Jesus, and I'm not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. I want to say to you, these men had a friend. Oh, no wonder they could turn the world upside down. They had a friend whom they were not ashamed of, and they wanted others to know that they had this friend. Let me show you something. The Bible says that they took him, Acts 4, and put old Peter and John in jail. I mean, beat them. And then they took him out and said, we're going to release you. I'm going to release you. But there's one condition. And if you start talking about and preaching in his name, or telling you anything, we'll slap you right back in jail. And just as soon as those fellows found the first street corner, old Simon Peter got up in verse 12 and said, there's no other name given under heaven. Well, boy, you must be saved. I mean, they had to tell that name. And there's something about it. Bless the Lord. I'm glad I'm not ashamed of the Lord Jesus Christ. And brother, when the church gets to that place, uh, that you'll go out and say, Hallelujah, I want to tell you about the friend uh, that loved me closer than a brother, uh, and a friend that went with me to the end, uh, and a friend in whom I can depend. Uh, no wonder these men uh, turned the world upside down. Uh, they had a friend uh, they were not ashamed of. Uh, and then they, they had something else, and this is what we need tonight. Uh, they had a fear of the terror of the Lord uh, that they, they never got to the place they didn't believe it. Uh, that my Bible said, uh, Paul said, I came to you in fear uh, and much trembling. You know why he said that? Uh, he said that because in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, uh, he says, he talked about the terror of the Lord. Uh, knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, uh, we persuade men. Uh, brother, these men had a fear of that terror and they never got to the place that they didn't believe it. Uh, you know, many of our our churches used to preach on hell. Many of our preachers used to preach on hell. And they used to preach that there's an everlasting, uh, blistering, consuming, tormenting hell. That there are a lot of churches tonight, bless your heart, and they preach as if hell had gone out. And there are a lot of Christians that cannot say they believe in an everlasting, consuming, burning hell. Big evangelists across this country said that he no longer believed in the fires of hell were literal. But my Bible said there's a place where the worm doth not and the fire is not quenched. The book says, and I'm tormented in this flame. The Bible said, these shall go away in everlasting punishment. I never did know this man. My daddy knew him. But daddy said he couldn't preach a lick. I mean, daddy said he couldn't preach a lick. But said he'd close his Bible and run up down the aisle and holler, Hell! And said he'd grow up down the aisle and holler, Fire! And daddy said that old mountain preacher would cry and say there's a hell. And said he'd stop at every pew and look him in the face and say, Folks, you don't believe it. Oh! But he said there is an everlasting, consuming, blistering, eternal, burning hell. I want you to know these men that turned the world upside down had a fear of the terror of God for men. And they knew that hell was waiting the lost and the unregenerated and the men that were without God. And therefore, my friend, they came and turned the world upside down. I believe this with all of my soul tonight. My friend, when we get to that point, Please, uh, that we'll fear for those that are lost uh, because we know that they're going to an everlasting, uh, consuming, burning hell. Uh, no wonder these men turned the world upside down. Uh, no wonder people said, look at them. Uh, bless God, over at Philippi, they had an earthquake. Uh, over at Philippi, a fortune teller got saved. Uh, over at Philippi, a saleswoman, uh, a seller of purple was saved. Uh, look what these men have done. They turned the world upside down. You know why? I gave you these. Let me come to that last one again. I want to reemphasize that. They had a fear of the terror of the Lord. And they believed that when a man dies, they believed that when a man dies without God, they believed that he'd go to hell. Now, brother, there are not many of us that believe that tonight. I mean, you don't believe that when your brother dies out of God and out of Christ, uh, you don't believe when that sister in your family dies uh, that's lost, uh, that she's going to beg for water a billion years from now and you'll scream and, uh, and suffer in the flames of the damned. Uh, but these men believed it. Uh, they knew the terror of the Lord. Uh, and, brother, they turned the world upside down. Uh, they never got to the place they disbelieved it. Uh, 
I've heard preachers say, I used to believe it, but I don't believe it now. I was over in Athens, Tennessee one time in a big tent meeting. We had the Spear family there in a big camp meeting years ago with old Dad Spear. And the Spear family was together. And I never will forget in that tent meeting. Had a man there, a Methodist preacher I loved very much. And he could pray. But he said to me one night with tears, his name was Brother Thorne. He said, Preacher, I just can't believe that there's a place called hell where men never die and where they'll burn forever. I looked him in the face and I said, Sir, if it's not so, the Bible stops right. I said, Because this book teaches it. I said, Jesus preached on hell 13 times more than he did about heaven. Now I said, You'll find the New Testament over and over again talking about the doom of the lost, uh, talking about the place and the state of the wicked, uh, when a man dies without God, without hope and without mercy. Uh, brother, we'd better have that fear of the terror of the Lord. Uh, these men stirred. Uh, these men turned the world upside down. Now watch this, and I'll close. Two illustrations. First, there's a French infidel. You ever been to Paris? It's a wicked, it's a wicked place. And in that place, Paris, years ago, in an old prison, there was a young man that that said, I'm going to, I'm going down and I'm going to, I'm going to witness to everybody that's down there in that prison house. And that young man came, listen to me, and he started with his Bible. He started in there and he stopped a man. He said, do you, do you know the Lord? The man said, I'm saved. He said, thank God, I'm glad you're saved. Finally, he got down just to a, a cell and the warden said, don't go in there. That man's infidel. And he's dying with some kind of terminal disease. Terminal means no cure. Means he's sure to die. So he's died. And when he and when this young preacher walked in with this Bible, he said to that old wicked infidel, that blasphemous man that said there was no God, nothing to the Bible, looked down and said, Mister, you're dying. You better get saved or you're going to hell. And when he said, You better get saved, you're going to hell, that old infidel reached up and pulled that young preacher down. And said, look me straight in the eye. He said, tell me that again. And the young preacher said, listen. If you don't get saved, you're going straight to hell when you die. And that infidel tried to tighten his grip on him. Looked him eyeball to eyeball. And said, sir, <clears throat> if I believe that, of course I don't believe that. He said, I don't believe there's a God, and I don't believe there's a heaven, and I don't believe there's a hell, but if I believe what you said, he said, you're a hypocrite. He said, you're the biggest hypocrite I ever saw. He said, as sick as I am, as sick as I am, if I believe that men went to an everlasting, consuming, burning hell, I'd beg the warden to let me out. And I'd crawl down the streets of Paris, the cobblestones, until I'd wear my kneecaps out, knocking on doors and telling people there's a hell and telling people there's going to that place and said, I don't believe that. But if I did, if I was as sick as I am now, and I believe there's a hell, I, I'd go out there and wear my kneecaps off, knocking on doors, crawling on my knees and saying, No! Die without God, you're going to hell. Brother Jesse Henley is a great preacher from Atlanta. He said years ago, he's standing in a hospital in Atlanta, Georgia. And he said a 14-year-old boy out of his church was dying. And he said that 14-year-old boy said, Brother Henley, he said, I'm, I'm going to hell. He said, son, why, you've been in our Sunday school. He said, I know, but I've never been saved. I'm going to hell. Brother Henley said he tried his best to win that boy to Jesus. And said the boy died and went to hell. He said, after the funeral, two days later, he said, I went down on Memorial Drive, and they've still got it, and it'll always be there until the resurrection, and the first resurrection, the, the, the dead in Christ will come forward. The second resurrection, those wicked dead will be raised, but there's a Confederate cemetery. It's got a big fence around it. Brother Henley said, after he'd finished with the funeral over to another cemetery, he drove up there, didn't know why, and he pulled up and stopped, and there's a guard out there, and he said, I'm sorry! It, this is a memorial. This is a Confederate cemetery. You can't come in here. Because nobody's alive now. Probably to have any kinfolk anyway in here. And you can't come in. And Preacher Henley said, I'm a preacher. I just came from another graveyard. Would you let me in? I won't have prayer in this graveyard. 
And he said, the man said, all right, but don't stay long. And he opened up the gate there, that Confederate graveyard. And Preacher Henley said, I drove in. I got out of my car. He said, I walked over to a tombstone. And he said, I got down to that tombstone. And, I, and the man was standing over there. And I said, he said, don't bother me. I'm going to just pray. I'm, I'm going to hurt a thing. just going to pray. And he said, I put my arm around that tombstone. And he said, you know, I started calling on God. And he said, God, I want you to show this preacher something. Is there really a hell like I've been preaching? And he said, oh, God, did that boy go there out of my church? And he said, did you know? He said, I stayed there by that tombstone with my arm around it for over an hour and a half. And he said, you won't believe it, but that tombstone got hot. And he said, I saw the greatest sea of fire that a man's ever gazed on. And I saw hands reaching up out of that fire of that lake. And he said, I said, oh, God, oh, God, there it is. <laughs> oh, he said, God, it's real. I knew it because the Bible said it. And you showed it to me. And he said, I saw that boy reach up that hand and beg for somebody to help him. And there wasn't anybody there that could reach him. He said, I went back to my church, Colonial Hills Baptist Church. I preached on hell for six weeks. Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night, Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. Said we had hundreds saved. Said the church filled up. People were coming. I was weeping and screaming hell. Oh, he said Atlanta was stirred. We went to the ballpark. And he said, God sent a revival. He said, you know why? He said, because I got to the place where I really believed that there was a blistering, consuming hell. These men had the fear of the terror of God. No wonder it said they turned the world upside down. A lady came to me last week over in Burlington, North Carolina. She's one of our best friends. And she said, my boy went to hell. I remember the case. I remember the time. And I said, ma'am, I'm not to judge. I'm not saying whether your boy went to hell or not. That lady just last week up in Victory Baptist Church, Brother Cobb's church, you know where it is, Brother Sammy, stood there and said, Brother Mays, the only boy I ever had went to hell. Went to hell. Went to hell. Went to hell. I tell you, I didn't know what to tell her. I said, lady, I, don't, I didn't know your boy that good. I, she said, you used to come here, you preach. But Brother Mays, he died without God. He went to hell. You know what the undertaker told me? He said, Brother Mays, that mother is nearly crazy. Said she wakes up at night screaming, my boy went to hell. Listen to me, as sure as you're in this place, and as sure as my name's Brother Mays Jackson, we need to get so stirred about these things so the people around here would say, Brother, they turned the world upside down. We need to leave out of here tonight. The wicked, I mean, the, the Bible says, base are sort of me in I mean, that unbelieving crowd and say something's happening over that concord. And God has turned it upside down. And God's turned it upside down. Every head bowed and eye closed. And God turned it upside down. The Bible said, these wicked men, said, these men have turned the world upside down. Oh, my said, these men have turned the world upside down. Oh, listen, is, is anybody ever say that about you? Especially some old wicked, unbelieving infidel that would go to a Christian's home, knock the door down, tire the window out, rest the man, bring that man up there to the city council and say, only thing I can say about these men, they've turned the world upside down. The only thing we can acclaim, these men have turned the world upside down. I want to ask you something tonight. you believe it? Do you believe what these men believed? Are you willing to let God use you as a channel, my friend, to believe these things and go out? Whoa, you say, Brother Mays, and let God use your life. Let God use your testimony and let God use your talent. And be that Christian that will turn this thing upside down for God. It said these men have turned the world upside down. I'm going to ask you about three things tonight. And I want you to be honest with me. How many people in this house can say, Preacher, I want you to know that everything's under the blood. 
Thank God I'm in fellowship with God. Preacher, if God called me out before daylight, I'd be ready to meet him. Slip up your hand. Let me see it. Don't lift it up now if there's something there. You be sure that you're right. When you step up that hand, all right, you can take that hand down. Let me ask you the second question. How many of you say, Preacher, I've been saved, but I know tonight God's dealt with me, and I've got some things in my life that's just not right, and I want you to pray for me. Would you step up that hand? Let me see it. Slip it up there. Let me see it. Christian, I want to pray for you back there. I want to remember you in prayer. Would you step up that hand? Preacher, I want you to know tonight that God's dealt with my heart. I'm saved, but there's some things that's just not right. Come on, slip up your hand. Ought to be several back there. You know where you Some of you young people ought to lift that hand. Yes, God bless you, son. Yes, God bless you there. Yes, God bless you here, sir. Yes, God bless you there, ma'am. Is that another? Now, just be honest with God. We'll never have revival when we're honest with God. You say, Brother Mays, I know I've been saved, but there's some things that's just not right. Slip up that hand. Let me see it. Let me see it. Yes, God bless you back there. I see it. Is there another? Is there one more? That's four. Is there another? Lift up your hand. Preacher, I know I've been saved, but there's some things not right in my life. There are four people in this house. I believe there's some more. Don't lift your hand. My friend, until you hear God and obey God, it'll never be in your life what it ought to be for Jesus. I mean, you won't do nothing for God. You, you'll never be accounted to, to do something for Jesus. You'll never be accounted very much until you really get everything straightened out. Four people. Is there another? Last time I asked you. Yes, God bless the little one there. That's five. Is there one more? Preacher, I'm saved. But there's some things not right in my life. I want you to get them. That's revival when you get that straightened out. Is there another? Let me see your hand. Last time I asked you. Any other Christian anywhere all the way back? All right. One more question. How many of you say, Preacher, I'm lost. If I walk out of here tonight and die... Oh, like I am in my sin, I'd go to hell. Preacher, I don't know that I'm saved, but I want you to pray for me. Would you step up that hand? Would you lift it up? Let me see it tonight. God bless the little one here. Is there another? Lift up your hand. Let me see it. Brother Mays, I'm not saved. I want you to pray for me. Hold up your hand. Let me see it. Would you hold it up? Maybe there's a mother back there, and you say, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. Maybe there's a dad back there, and you say, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved. Maybe there's a young person. You're not sure you're right with God. Step up that hand. Let me see it. Would you hold it up? Anybody else? Quickly. All the way back. Our Father, I thank you tonight for these that have lifted their hands. And, oh, Holy Spirit of God, I pray that every one of these that raised that hand on the first stanza will come running down this aisle. Lord, I'm glad for the big altar, the long altar, all the way around the front of this church from wall to wall. God, you're just waiting for men to come and kneel and humble themselves and seek your face. Lord, I pray for every one of these that raised a hand. I pray for these tonight that did not raise a hand. May they come running now, Lord. Oh, Spirit of God, rest them. Lord, don't let a soul leave here that you're speaking to right now. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. I'm going to stand, stand and see what they were. Number 81, just as I am without one plea. Now, Brother Sam is going to stand here. I want you to come out right on. Every one of you, raise your hand. I want you to step out and come out here to this altar. I mean, everyone. And if you didn't raise your hand, come on. Let's get in the altar tonight. Let's get it straightened out with God. You, the lady back there raised her hand, said she wasn't saved. The young man said he wasn't saved. Come right on while we sing. And the rest of you, come on. We're going to sing, all right, while we sing. Come quickly. Just as I am. Yes, yes. Brother Mays, God speaking to me. Come on. Come on tonight. Amen. God's coming on tonight.